thank Real Liberty Media for giving me this opportunity to use some of their server space to do a little stream and a podcast. I wanted to mention if you want to join the chat live, uh, if you're listening to this live, not as a podcast, uh, you can join the chat in the uh, off the Real Liberty Media site or on uh, IRC at uh, hashtag, hashtag Real Liberty Media. This is Doc Mike. I'm the Redneck Dentist. I've just started this uh, stream a week ago. This is the second show. It's kind of fun to kind of prepare all week, although you do kind of, I don't know, learn a bunch of stuff that <laughs> you kind of wish you didn't know. I don't know. I always think uh, knowledge is good. Uh, it just seems like right now we are in such a crazy place uh, with the whole world seemingly locked down due to COVID. And I just wonder how much more uh, we're going to take. It's kind of amazing that we've allowed so much to happen to us. It's kind of crazy that we've all kind of just allowed ourselves to be dominated by government interventions uh and, and it's interesting. I'm hearing more and more. Uh, as you guys know, I am a dentist, so I, and I do work four days a week still. And um, I'm hearing more and more people who are so really, I don't know, more than dissatisfied. People are getting angry and hurt. Today, I did some volunteer work on a dental van, which I like to do that uh, like every other month, something like that, because uh, I do sacrifice my weekend to do it, or some of my weekend, a little bit of Saturday. Uh, sometimes are longer days, but today was pretty short. Went from, oh, probably did about four hours. But two people today, one woman who is, uh, she's probably my age, 60-something, I don't know, maybe 70. So last year her husband died right before COVID happened. And so she's been kind of isolated for this entire year. And, you know, just in her telling me that story about what's happened to her, you could just tell the frustration that she has been going through for a year. And it really kind of felt for her too, you know, just like, man, I mean, how, you know, how horrible is that, that, you know, you lose your life long partner and it wasn't too COVID but uh, you know and then you spend I don't know how much time it's been you know a year that she hasn't even really been able to be with or around people just like a normal you know everyday thing I asked her the event that I did was sponsored by a church and I asked her if she goes to church and she said yeah and they they started having services again but you know they're socially distanced and you know you can't touch anybody and man you could just kind of tell that this person really needed some compassion some you know human interaction and it's it's just surprising to me of course now with uh, so much so much of our social media the thing I think we all got sucked into thinking it was going to be a great place for us to get together and to share ideas and now so much of that is being taken away from us that uh, it could have been a place where we could have just all decided uh, you know to pick a day and say okay on this day we are no longer following your stupid suggestions or regulations or whatever you want to call it uh, I know here in Oregon we have Governor Kate Brown she's a flipping idiot but I guess she's not so much of an idiot that she hasn't like uh, taken on the entire power you know kind of assigned herself as the almighty in this state uh, kind of like California tells everybody what to do and when to do it and that, you know, you're going to wear a mask or, you know, I guess what the cops are going to be called on you or I don't even know what what would happen if you just didn't do it. I mean, I know, you know, businesses 
I kind of feel bad for them because, you know, they have to have this mask mandate, I guess, because if they don't, then, you know, they're going to be, who knows, penalized or fined by OSHA or some other government agency for not following the rules. What really kind of disturbs me, I had this conversation today with somebody too, is that if you look at the states, the few states that just said, no, we're not doing this anymore. And I don't mean the ones that declared recently, like in the last week, I guess Texas and Mississippi have said, you know, yeah, we're done with this. Um, but Florida, it seems like, hasn't been doing a whole lot uh, this entire COVID lockdown since the government started telling us when and where we could go out and how we were to dress by that. I mean, if you're going to wear a mask and if, you know, how far apart we're going to be, they haven't been doing that. And, you know, if you look at the numbers between Florida and pretty much any other state, there's really no difference. So it's kind of amazing to me that we don't all just at some point say, Okay, now wait a minute. If there's no difference between what that state has done and they have not been following CDC guidelines or the government's recommendations or whatever, and their numbers aren't significantly different than states that have done those things, why are we doing it? And why... Ha of course, like I said, with all the social media lockdown where, you know, we were all sucked into believing that we could get on social media, you know, and organize um, events, let's say, protests, whatever. You know, we could have got on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, any of those things, and said, hey, you know what, on March 15th, it's over. We're done. We're not doing this anymore. And everybody on that day stop doing this ridiculous stuff but no it's like the american people a ton of them have just become sheep and they will do whatever the government says what's crazy about that is i used to work for the federal government i was a public health service officer from 1989 to 2005, I was a public health service officer, which means I was in the uniform services that provide public health. Uh, Dr. Fauci, Fauci is also in the public health service, basically, you could say. Uh, and here he makes this recommendation and everybody just, do you remember when Fauci was uh, making these recommendations and everybody was just all over Fauci, like he was going to be the man of the year and he was the greatest thing since, you know, sliced bread. And uh, it, it was crazy because he was making these recommendations and it didn't seem like they had anything really to back it up with. It was just like, okay, we're in panic mode. Uh, the only thing we can think to do is, you know, not socialize, put these masks on, stay away from each other, wash your hands, don't touch your face, you know, all that stuff. Here's the thing. Like, I was in the public health service. I wasn't the greatest dentist in the world. I probably didn't have the greatest recommendations in the world to become a public health service officer. My point is, you know, you think that some of these people are in those positions because they are the greatest in the world at what they do, but nothing really could be farther from the truth. A lot of times people go into those positions for very different reasons, certainly not because it's the most prestigious thing you can do, because it's not the most prestigious thing you can do. You know, if you really want to be known as an expert in the field of whatever it is you do, virology, immunology, dentistry, medicine, nursing, psychology, any of those things, you certainly don't go to work for the federal government. You actually end up in institutions of higher learning, usually associated with medical facilities, where you actually do some, you know, 
uh, research and publish papers and are recognized among your peers as one of the elites in your field as far as knowing what you're doing and being an expert in that you know field of information you know <laughs> I remember C. Everett Koop I don't know if if any of you remember C. Everett Koop when he was a Surgeon General, and he was a Surgeon General for a long time, and yes, I was fortunate enough to get to meet him at least once. He was like the last greatest Surgeon General in the United States. Now, that guy was a totally different story. He was just like a regular guy, but he knew his stuff as far as public health service went, or public health went. And he made some great recommendations at the time, and he had great foresight also. But ever since C. Everett Koop, the people that have been placed in that position, I would say, are far less than stellar examples of what the Surgeon General of the United States should be. Now, that's just one example, and I'm another example. I mean, I'm, I'm thankful that I had a that I had a career in the U.S. Public Health Service because it helped me finish off um, 29 years of uniform services in the United States, and I ended up with a nice retirement. And um, you know, and now I'm enjoying life. I still work, and I get that retirement check every month. It's really nice. But I wasn't the greatest dentist in the world. It wasn't like I was competing against the greatest dentist in the world to become part of, you know, the government's little public health service army. So I just want to say you have to kind of take with a grain of salt what you hear from our federal government. And I have some examples in today's uh, show <laughs> that makes me wonder... You know, how did we get here? And I mean, these are really good examples of people not being the greatest, uh, high, most highly qualified people for these jobs. Anyway, uh, I did want to say that I didn't even expect to go where I was going with that, but that's what makes live streaming, I guess, kind of fun and interesting is you never know what you're going to say or do but there it is hey i wanted to also share with you guys i hope you all know i am a listener so i don't know what kind of uh inspiration i had for doing a stream but i just thought it would be fun i think to do a stream and uh i i listen to people i'm not so much of a watcher like i I probably wouldn't watch a live stream, but I love to listen to people, and I love it when people really know. I don't even really care what they're talking about so much, although I'm sure I lean toward the stuff I'm interested in, but I love to listen to people who know what they're talking about, or they research really well and put out really good information, and I hope that's something that I'll be able to accomplish as I grow in this uh, streaming uh, experiment here and podcasting. Hopefully I provide you guys with really good information and uh, stimulate some thought. I guess that's what I'm really hoping to do. So last week I had mentioned a few times about uh, about uh, genital genital mutilation. And the reason I brought that up is because one of the um, Senate confirmation hearings last week was for this, um, let me get her name right, Rachel Levine. And here's the deal with Rachel Levine. And forgive me for not always being politically correct, but I, I mean, I, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to fall into that. But Rachel Levine is, I guess, transgender or whatever, which I don't, I'm not re I don't personally know what her or his thing is. I believe she was a man who is either now a female because she's had the surgeries or she identifies as a female. When you look at her, she looks like a 
not very well made up man. But here's the deal. So she believes that children from the age of three and above should be able to make a decision on what gender they will be for the rest of their life. What bothers me about this, I mean, I'm a kind of pretty conservative guy, so, I mean, it kind of bothers me in general that um, that he or she could have this ideology and be the person who's going to be... Um, Let's see, she is nominated for the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services. So she's going to be one of those people in that whole, let's just call it in general terms, public health service arena. And she believes that children should be able to make up their minds to change their body surgically from whatever age. And she doesn't really have a lower limit. Now here's my problem with that. Throughout the world, there are uh, cultures that mutilate uh, female sexual parts. And there's been a lot of institutions come out um, against female genital mutilation. I'm just going to name a few. The World Health Organization, which everybody praises as the know-all for world health, which they are also horrible at. Uh, the United Nations Population Fund. Um, let me see what else. Uh, United Nations Commission on Human Rights. The United Nations International Children Emergency Fund, UNICEF the Organization of African Unity and the World Medical Association. Uh, anyway, they all come out and say, no, you cannot mutilate women's genitals. That's basically what they're saying. This has got to stop. This is a worldwide crisis. And all these organizations who are supposedly respected for their stance on world health and human rights are saying, no, you can't do this. It's not right. And it's not right to women of adult age, and it's not right to children. But somehow in this country, we have somebody appointed or recommended for appointment as the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services, Rachel Levine, and she believes that children from the age of three years and up should be able to make that decision. I mean, three-year-olds can't tie their shoes, but they should be able to make, you know, decisions on whether to have their genitals changed. I, I don't, I don't understand. It's kind of funny that if you, because of course we're not calling it genital mutilation, we're calling it transgenderism so we change the terminology to make it sound like it's acceptable but it's the same thing you're still taken away you're still mutilating somebody's genitals you just change the name out of um i don't know some kind of political agenda for an extremely small percentage of the population. I'm going to just take a little break here and see, because I, I actually looked this number up. Um, oh, man. Let's see. Let's just say this. It's less than 1%. It's somewhere in the realm of 0.9% of the entire population Um is interested in becoming transgender okay she also actually believes that you should give uh you should give children hormone blockers until that they reach an age that they could make that decision so it's a little bit of hypocrisy going on right there so she says that you that you that uh, a child from the age of three and up should be able to make that decision 
but she's also saying, well, we should give them hormone blockers. In other words, you know, block testosterone, block estrogen, block whatever that would make you decide to be either male or female until you've kind of had enough life experience to decide which gender, I guess, you would like to be. This is a, It's just the craziest thing in the world. I'm fairly certain, although I haven't, you know, done any research myself, I'm fairly certain that even the people who supported this administration and elected these people, I'm fairly certain most of them don't want their children mutilated in this fashion. I So I don't know how the Biden administration decided to put her up for recommendation as the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services. Like, whose idea was that? I'm, I, I, I just... I know that the left, that the Democrat, that the progressive uh, liberals, I know that they want more of everything, but I really don't think that even they think this is a good idea. So I don't know how it happened, but guess what? She's not the only one. So in addition to her and her crazy ideas, and if you happen to watch if you happen to watch uh, Rand Paul question her, it was amazing that she wouldn't actually answer the questions over whether or not, uh, even though she made those statements in the past, she wouldn't turn around and uh, and say it now. So let me see, where else are we going here? It's... Oh, yeah. Something else kind of along those lines. And this is kind of uh, uh, interesting to me. Like somebody put out uh, like a um, an article on what celebrities thought of something. And I thought to myself, who, I mean, does anybody really give a crap what celebrities think? And unfortunately, I think the answer to that question is, yeah, people do. <laughs> and, you know, there are, I guess, some of them who are maybe somewhat educated. But I think, but I think for the most part, um, they're just actors and actresses. They don't have, like, degrees in biology and physiology and virology and physics and uh and energy uh <laughs> none of that stuff but yet you know they can parrot what somebody else says and everybody thinks that they're a genius or they're so i don't know what i don't know what the deal is now with people uh thinking that Sean Penn is a great ambassador for anything necessarily or uh I don't know, it's just strange to me that there would even be an article about celebrities and what they think about, you know, I don't know, the, let's say uh, green energy or transgenderism or basically human rights of any kind, because, or especially if you go back to the energy thing, hell, you you know that the things that they talk about and the things that they think are great for the world are not things that they're willing to do themselves. They're not willing to not fly on jets everywhere they go. They're not willing to give up their really expensive gas-guzzling cars. And I say they shouldn't, just as I shouldn't or you shouldn't. But they're sure willing to tell you how bad things are going to be and hope, I guess, that you're you're going to believe it and, you know, give up your gas guzzling car or your to, you know, turn your thermostat down so you're freezing during the winter time and not use your air conditioner in the summer because of whatever it is they say. Oh, I totally lost my train of thought, but hey, but that's what that's what happens when you when you when you're doing a live show, man. You can get off track really easily. Um, so let me let's see. I know, hate dead air, don't you? Kind of sucks. 
Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. Kind of to wrap that whole idea up. And I'm not going to get biblical, although I think you could find some biblical references to this, maybe the Tower of Babel kind of thing. But here's the deal. Man, it is kind of ludicrous to think that man is affecting the climate more than any other things associated with the planet Earth. This is my view on the whole kind of energy climate change thing. The climate has changed on its own long before we got here. Uh, Greenland. I'm told, was named Greenland because it was green. It wasn't a frozen sheet of ice. Um, there were times in the world's history when the planet was a lot warmer than it is now and a lot colder than it is now. It cycles. With or without us, it's going to cycle. Uh, one of my friends told me one time, this was like 10 years ago or something, that one of his friends, okay, so now we're so far removed, this probably doesn't make a bit of difference. Basically, what you're hearing is hearsay. But he said that his friend did a, did the math one time, and he took the population of the world, and he gave them nine square feet, a, a, a three square, a three foot by three foot square, and he figured out how much area that the entire population of the world would take up. And basically, he said you could fit the entire population of the world in a space the size of Rhode Island or something like that. Now, that's a little hard for me to believe. I haven't been to Rhode Island, so I don't really remember. Um, I, don't, I can't really say as uh, I remember how big it is or whatever. But just imagine that. And, and I don't know how many of you have flown over even the United States, but other parts of the world as well. I mean, when you're flying over countries, you know, most of it's not populated. Population Populations are kind of concentrated in areas where business is done, you know, where ports are, where you can get goods in and out of the country. But, you know, you fly across the United States from coast to coast, there's a lot of nothing. <laughs> there's a lot of little tiny towns, you know, and maybe villages and maybe just farms scattered across the landscape. But um, you see very few big cities, and then there's, you know, a big concentration of people in those big cities. But my point is, for for us to believe that we have that much power over the earth i think is is almost blasphemy in a way uh i i think we give ourselves far too much credit thinking that we're destroying the earth by our mere presence or using the natural resources that have been here and continue to provide uh, no matter how much we've grown. I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know, not have explosive population growth, but really, uh, I don't believe it would hurt the earth that much. And I think it's pretty much, it's pretty much just a political fight to get everybody to buckle in and pay more money for what it's just, a, it's just a reason to make more people make the more, uh, make Rich people richer is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. And to make you pay the price for it. You know, Al Gore doesn't pay the price for it. He's not willing to give up his private jet to fly all over the place because it's so important what Al Gore has to say to save the planet. I'm going to have a drink. Hang on. Sorry. You know what's crazy? When I was in uh, junior high school, I think, yeah, junior high school. You know, the big talk back then was that we were coming into an ice age, that we had to do something because the you know the, we were going back to this ten thousand year cycle and we were going to have an ice age. And I mean, it was serious back then. That was in the seventies, like 
mid, I think kind of mid 70s. And, you know, I was really concerned because I was just a stupid young teenager, didn't know any better. And I was like, man, there's going to be an ice age. I mean, what, what, what can we do about it? Well, there's nothing you can do about it. That's the thing. Uh, I always joked that when they talked about how greenhouse gases were going to heat up the earth, I was like, man, bring it on. We're going to have a longer growing season at this latitude. So, you know, more farmers will be able to produce more, uh, more food because more of the more of the land would be in the warmer zone and you know you could grow food longer so it would kind of make sense it would actually be a good thing for the plant to warm up a bit so we could have you know produce more food for the for the larger population of people that are going to be populating the planet but that's just my take on it i have you know some other kind of crazy thoughts on the environment too and uh, maybe we'll get into those later, but one of the things that I like to point out to people, especially when they're trying to um, save the last or, you know, uh, rare, you know, not white rhino, I'm not going to pick on any one individual species, but here's the deal, 95% of species that ever lived on the earth are gone, they're extinct, 95%. And that comes from, you know, my uh, biology degree from way back when. But if 95% of things that have lived on this earth are have gone extinct, don't you think it's kind of a natural cycle that, you know, as the earth evolves and animals don't, that they become extinct? So, you know, when... I'm not going to get into that. But let's just say there's some species that you just have to look at and say, why are we spending, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars to save that one species? What does that one species do? Let me tell you something else. So you always hear about uh, some certain insect or animal being the cornerstone species, right? Like I hear this about honeybees all the time. And trust me, I love honey. I love honeybees. I love what they do. And I hope to God that they don't go extinct, at least in my lifetime. But whenever you hear somebody talk about the cornerstone species, you got to think to yourself, okay, in the history of the world, there had to have been another cornerstone species. And for those of you who don't know what that means, basically what they're saying is, if this species fails, the rest of the world goes with it. The rest of life will fail with it. Well, so in the history of the world, you have to imagine that there had to have been another cornerstone species and that it has gone extinct, and the world didn't fail. I mean, if you look at, um, if you believe in evolution, and you look at how things evolved, they basically evolved to challenges to their environment. And if they evolve as rapidly as their environment changes, then they're a success. If they don't evolve as quickly as their environment is changing, then they fail. It's pretty simple. The world is brutally, uh, I guess, fair or unfair. It You either make it or you don't make it. Um I'm talking about the world uh, being fair or unfair, I, man, I get distracted. I got to tell you, I'm a little bit OCD. So things come in my mind, I'm going to share them with you. And this is a little more personal. Uh, and it's, it is actually kind of cool too. So I have five acres of land and two parts of it are pasture. And then we have, you know, implement building, woodshed, a house and stuff. Anyway, uh, I was in the north pasture about a month, six weeks ago, and I saw this hole in the ground. 
And I was like, man, that's a weird looking hole. Like I have gophers. I know what gopher holes and and uh, mole mound stuff like that looks like. But this was just an open hole. There was actually no dirt around this hole. And the, and the sides of the hole were smooth, so I knew that something was going in and out of this hole. And so I thought, okay, we're going to put some game cameras up on this hole and see what is going in and out of that hole. So after, I don't know, a week or so of tuning with some game cameras, we caught two raccoons coming out of that hole. And I was like... Man, I didn't really know raccoons like burrowed in the ground or made their, you know, burrows in the ground. Like mostly I thought they'd find a, I don't know, a hole like in the bank of a stream or in a tree or whatever. I didn't really know that they actually had like their dens underground. Well, anyway, these two did or one, I don't know. We have pictures of two coons around that hole. But this is the craziest thing. So literally less than a week later, we got pictures on our game cameras of a freaking owl taking one of those coons. <laughs> Speaking about the world and nature being, you know, fair or unfair. I mean, that's just the way it is. This was a big owl, too. I was kind of shocked at how big this owl was because these coons weren't like little coons. They weren't baby coons. I mean, they might have been teenagers or young adults, but they weren't like kits, you know what I mean? They weren't like the babies, the, the newborns of the year. They actually had some meat on them, and they were, I thought they were adults that were either mating or something. But um, Anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you because it's kind of a real life story about how brutal, uh, you know, the, how brutal the wild world is. Uh, those coons just came out to go, who knows, do what, probably forage for food or whatever, and this owl took him out, or at least one of them, so I don't know. Oh yeah, we got a picture of the other coon on a different game camera about 200 yards away, so I don't know if he decided to... Um, take off or uh or what so now i got totally totally distracted but i just wanted to share kind of a personal story you know i am doc mike the redneck dentist i just like to share stories that show you kind of why i'm why i am the redneck dentist i also wanted to tell you guys a little bit about my tagline in case anybody's interested so my tagline is all bleeding eventually stops and I'll tell you where that came from, in case I didn't mention it last week. But the very first day of oral surgery class in dental school, the oral surgeon who was teaching the class came in, you know, and we're all kind of, we get settled down, we're all quiet, waiting for his, you know, him to bless us with his great knowledge of oral surgery. And he just looks at all of us and he says, all bleeding eventually stops. And <laughs> I just remember letting that sink in for a minute, and he just let it sink in for a minute. Like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, you either bleed out or, you know, you stop bleeding, one of the two. And I kind of use that tagline with my show because it's kind of, that's kind of how I feel right now. It's like <laughs> we're bleeding as a country. Like so much is happening to us. I, I don't even know how to express well how much I hate <laughs> the lawmakers in this country because basically day after day all they do is think about how to make another law or another regulation and every time they make a law or regulation whatever you want to call it it takes another chunk another piece of our freedom away 20 years ago, I probably then got to the point where I was like, man, I hope that, you know, during voting season, presidential elections or re-elections, whatever, my hope was always that there would be a perfect split, sorry, a perfect split so that 
nobody could get anything done. <laughs> like, hopefully, you know, if you had a 50-50 split, or better yet, if you had a 51-49 split so that the VP was on the 49 side so that, you know, whenever there was a tie, it would just remain a tie and they'd hopefully have to throw that stuff out. Um, because I was just tired of seeing year after year thousands of new regulations passed that didn't make any sense. And kind of going back to this whole COVID thing where I started today. It's time that we take responsibility for our own health. It's time for people to let us make those decisions. It's time for us to say, no, I'm not wearing a mask in this situation. No, I'm not social distancing in this situation. I am going to go to the restaurant, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to order a meal, and I'm going to eat something delicious that somebody else cooks and somebody else cleans up, and I'm going to tip them and I'm going to walk away happy and I'm done with this stuff. But it's not going to happen, unfortunately. I mean, individually, I think some of us make those decisions. I sure wish we could just have a national day where we just say, screw it, we're not doing it anymore, and then just quit doing it. Um, yeah, I'm kind of tired of all that stuff. I'm sure you guys are too. I'm glad to see, though, so many of you guys, uh, you're encouraging, really, to see that a lot of you don't participate in this. I know that you know, I'm I'm forced to participate in it in some way. I guess I would say I'm forced to participate in it. That's only if I still want to work. If I want to work, I have to do those things. Luckily, as a dentist, I'm wearing a mask and gown and glasses and freaking everything anyway. So it's really not that much more unusual at work than it is, uh, you know, for me any other day. But outside of work, man... Uh, I think it was like a week or so ago, my wife and I left the house and actually went to the, well, we went to Salem, Oregon, which is not a big city, but it's a city. And it was the first time in a year that we had gone somewhere. And it was kind of awesome. You know, I was thinking I was going to probably buy everything there was to buy. And we went to Costco and uh, I didn't, which is amazing that I had some kind of restraint because I really wanted to just be out and experience. We even, kind of, let me see, did we go out to eat? I don't even think, no, we didn't even go out to eat. That's kind of crazy because I really wanted to get some hot food while we were in town. It was just kind of fun. We went to three different places. And I, I mean, how crazy is that? that it's been one year since we went and did something like that. And I'm sure for other people it's the same. And hopefully uh, hopefully we get back to, you know, I hope more states get on this bandwagon. I, Oregon's going to be the last. You can bet in 2022, if I'm still on here doing a stream, I'm still going to be saying that Oregon's completely locked down. God, I hope not. But I just have a feeling we, that we that we are going, that we're still going to be doing it. Let me think of who else I want to, <laughs> who else I want to talk about today. Oh, I, hey, I did want to say something about the vaccine, by the way. I don't care if you believe in getting the vaccine or not. I had a couple things uh, lately that made me think, okay, maybe this is okay. I, you know, I can see both sides. I've looked at both sides of the information. I looked at whether a virus has been isolated or not. It doesn't look like they've ever isolated the COVID-19 virus correctly anyway. So I could get on I could I could be on that side. I could be on the side that says ah, vaccines suck. I hate vaccines. Um I am not a vaccine person, but I have had the uh, Moderna vaccine. And I did it kind of just to be over it in a way. 
and um, to protect myself and my family. If there's some protection, if not, I mean, if the government's trying to kill us, oh, well, they got me, but I'm kind of at the age, I, I don't care that much. <laughs> I'm kind of at the age where I, I felt like I didn't have anything to lose. If the if the vaccine sucks, if there's something horrible, okay. If it gives me some protection, that'd be great. So I was w looking at a story that, um, that I saw on a local news station, and it was a local doctor who studies immunology and he actually did a study on whether or not the vaccine uh, provides protection to babies through mother's milk because he had a baby his wife had a baby during the COVID lockdown and he's an immunologist so he and his wife got the vaccine and then he did a study on a number of women who had babies during the during the COVID era, let's say, and they found that babies had some protection provided by their parent mom having that vaccination. So I'm not trying. Whoops, sorry. I'm not trying to talk you into or out of getting vaccinated. As with everything else in life. I think it's your choice, your decision, and I think you just do the best you can at gathering the information that you can gather, and you make that decision. Just like using, you know, just like using, uh, well, any other drugs or recreational things in your life, you have to decide what's best for you, and that's what I want us to get back to. I want us to get back to where we have control over how we live our lives. And if we don't feel we're putting ourselves at risk, then we live our life that way. And if we feel like we need to give ourselves some protection, then we stay at home and we isolate or we wear a mask out in public. But we don't have to have every single person locked down for crying out loud. And that's where this whole COVID thing got off to a, a bad start from the very beginning was locking everybody down when 95% of the population was not at risk to die from this damn COVID infection. 95% of the population was going to survive it one way or the other. So why... Did we lock everybody down? And I know that there's a reason why. And it has everything to do with politics and seeing if, if anybody will stand up. And guess what? A lot of people aren't. Although I think there's a lot of people, there's several different organizations that are gathering strength and forces to not do this anymore and not let this happen again and just just not obey something you know that some governor uh decides <laughs> and speaking about people who are unqualified to make these decisions i think there you go you know politicians in general are not qualified to make those decisions all right moving on i torn up a bunch of people so far. Oh, I've got a lot more people to go. Hey, I do have a question for you. This is kind of crazy. I was, you know, there's this whole big thing about how many children go missing every year. And I ran across the craziest story uh, that Tennessee... Yeah, the Tennessee found 150 missing children. And I was thinking to myself, how in the heck does a state like Tennessee, now I've been to Tennessee, I haven't you know, spent a lot of time there, but a little bit of time. You know, how does a state like Tennessee have 150 missing children at one time? That's kind of a scary number, but I guess it's really not that scary. I guess that's somewhat normal because included in that number are a lot of people who are runaways and a lot of people who were in foster care that, you know, they weren't really missing. 
they just got moved to different foster care facilities or homes or whatever, and they weren't being accounted for the way they were before. But, you know, that was kind of an eye-opener for me that, that they would even report that they had 150 children missing. And it kind of made me think, oh, man, I wonder how many children we have missing in Oregon. And I wonder where do I get that number? I'm going to have to go... I'm going to have to go look and uh, see what it is. Drink time. Drink up, everybody. Anyway, I do want to thank you guys for joining me on this uh, stream or podcast, whatever it is, however you're listening to me. And I do want to thank Real Liberty Media again for you know having me join them. That's been awesome. You guys, if you want to join the chat, you know you can catch it with the with the uh, on the show real real liberty media, and uh, you can find the chat there or on IRC hashtag hashtag real liberty media. All right. Oh my gosh, I'm like sweating because uh, I got so wound up. Okay, one other thing I wanted to cover uh, is this. Let's see, do I want to go there yet? Did we beat the whole COVID thing into the ground? Yeah, I think we did. Oh, I was going to talk about how, oh, I was going to talk about how drugs are getting into this country and how there, so much of it is coming from China into Mexico, the precursors, it's being made in Mexico and brought into the United States, but I'm going to save that. I just wanted to say, uh, <laughs> I heard that 9% of the current uh, stimulus bill actually, you know, addresses COVID needs and the American people. 9% of the bill originally. And Biden asked what he could cut out. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you could cut out the other 91%. That's what you could cut out. Uh, but that's not going to happen. And I don't know if you guys have seen what's in the bill. I, I, Wanted to read the bill before I started my show, but there, I just didn't have time. 600 and something pages. And, of course, some amendments thrown in there for good measure. But uh, it's crazy that $1.9 trillion is being passed. And I don't know I don't know what financially 9% is. But I don't know if it's 9% of the money or 9% of the number of pages in the bill addresses COVID related issues, but the rest of it is all fluff. So anyway, oh, and the other thing is, I guess $1 trillion of the previous bill never even has been spent. So I don't know why they're passing another $1.9 trillion, but uh, you got to imagine that you, you have to imagine that printing that kind of money is going to do something horrible to the rest of us. That inflation and hyperinflation could be on the way. So I didn't talk about any kind of food preparation this week. Uh, but maybe it's a really good time, especially being March. It's a good time to start thinking about planting some gardens. Any, any Even if you live in apartments and can do a little bit of container gardening, it's better than nothing. I think in the future I can talk about container gardening a little bit and certain foods that you could grow in a container. But, I mean, the bottom line is you're going to be, you know, you, you're going to have to do with what you got and we're going to have to all make it work. It's kind of interesting. My wife's mom lived with us for, uh, well, for a long time, um, maybe 20 something years and and she lived to be 97 and one day I got to sit down and just chat with her just her and I at the table and uh because she was born in 1919 and then so we were talking about the the great depression and this was really kind of cool so her dad was uh he was lucky enough to be working somewhere and I forget I it seems to me it was some kind of a power company even at the time, nineteen late nineteen twenties is when we were the time period we we're kind of talking about. Anyway, he, so he and they had a farm and they had cows and they had to get up and milk the cows and um um 
<laughs> yeah, no kidding. They said the host should know there is a drought that will swallow his state. Yeah, that's no kidding. That's coming. Anyway, so they had a farm. They had cows, and they were able to provide not only for themselves, but when he, when my wife's mom's dad would go to the market and buy flour and buy you know goods, he would buy some for the neighbors too the neighbors who had been laid off. And it was kind of interesting to hear him talking about or to hear her talking about how, you know, well, you just did what you had to do and you helped out, you know, the people around you. Because, I mean, at that time, people were a lot closer as far as being neighbors go. I mean, I kind of know my neighbors, but I don't really know my neighbors. You know what I mean? I don't see them on a daily basis. I don't, you know, we don't, you know, see how their livestock are doing. And, you know, we don't have livestock now. We have chickens right now and we're renting, uh, leasing pasture land for horse, horses. But, I mean, it was different than you actually knew each other. You actually talked to each other and you kind of knew what was going on. You knew each other's kids and all that stuff. And you cared enough to buy extra food for the people who didn't have any. So that was, that was, it was pretty neat talking to her, you know, and when they when they would get milk from the cows, they would share the milk, you know, from the cows. Uh, and that's just the way it was for, for them. I mean, that's one, that's one uh, example of maybe we're, we're going to have to go from this point forward or when inflation and hyperinflation starts taking over. I just can't imagine that there's not some really ugly end coming at us and maybe uh, the whole COVID lockdown was actually part of preparing us for that. I know one other thing that uh, I think it was the Weimar Republic when right before uh, hyperinflation set in there. And I think even, I think Clyde Lewis actually talked about this when he was in South America and I can't remember where he was, but I think he was in South America when hyperinflation started setting in and um what happened right before that hyperinflation and inflation started happening it was like all recreational illegal drugs were suddenly legalized everybody you know it's kind of like yeah just don't arrest people you know get make sure they get you know, liquored up or stoned out of their minds so they don't see what's happening or, you know, don't, I, I don't know. There was, there was something to be said for, you know, suddenly kind of just letting everybody do whatever because the economy was going to be ruined. And I mean, there's examples of that, like right here in Oregon, I can tell you that, you know, they basically legalize all hard drugs and by basically legalize, what I'm saying is, I think right now it's a hundred dollar fine, no matter which drug you are caught with. If it's like a personal use amount, I didn't. I don't even know what the amount is, but this just got passed recently. So it's a hundred dollar fine, or you can listen to a like an addiction uh, webinar or something like that, and have that fine removed or have the charge removed or whatever. But basically, it's no big deal. Uh, so it kind of makes me worry. Like, <laughs> like if, uh, like if other states start legalizing drugs like crazy, which I'm fine with. Like I say, do what you will, just don't harm others. Um, kind of makes me worry that we're heading right down that same path. Man, I have a ton of notes and we are pretty much done so again i just want to thank you all for listening in thank you for chatting just thanks for supporting real liberty media and thanks for listening to my show next week i will be back with uh, more i i'll make sure to include a segment next week on producing your own food of some kind or acquiring food i mean it's like you all know how to do that but when things get tough and food isn't available at the nearest, you know, supermarket, you're going to have to be creative and you have to be prepared also. Anyway, so this is Doc Mike, the Redneck Dentist. I will see you guys next week. Thank you.